Hey everyone, welcome to the very last chapel for the 2020 spring semester at Central. Um, me and Alex are going to lead you guys in a couple of songs, and then later on, Daryl Ammon's going to come up and preach the last sermon for our last chapel. All right, let's get started. <laughs> surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus that you will be with me when I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome through the valley of 
the shadow I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone you will go before you fight my every battle and I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone you will go before me you will never leave me I am not alone I am just one last time, um, even virtually. I pray that um, we would just be united um, together. I pray that you would just speak through Mr. Ammon today and um, just allow us to hear his message and whatever you want to say through him, Lord, help us to be receptive to it. And um, I pray that we would just um, take advantage of this one last time being able to meet together. And I thank you for um, just this semester, Lord, and all the work that you've done um, in our lives, Lord, I pray that we will not forget that and that we will continue to take that with us throughout this summer. In your name I pray, amen. Well, good morning, church. It uh, seems like I have to say that whether we're doing this virtually or uh, non-virtually. The text that I've chosen to speak from this morning is uh, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we're going to read the 24th through the 27th verses of Matthew chapter 7. It says this, Every then, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who has built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house. 
but he did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. (coughs) Excuse me. There are for each of us times in our lives when we experience pain. And that pain can take all kinds of different ways in which it's inflected on us. For a lot of us, for those of you who are in this audience, many of you, you might be graduating this year. And graduation was nothing that you expected. The celebrations aren't there. The honors chapel isn't happening last week. And and all of those things that you were excited about experiencing as you came to the end of your four hard years of work, for some of you, maybe five for some of you, that is not happening this year. And it's painful. It's hard. Some of you are experiencing loss in different ways. Some of you are uh, experiencing people who are sick in your family or disassociation because of what's going on in our culture right now. Pain happens to each one of us. And none of us are immune from the devastation that happens uh, that can descend upon us like a boulder. When the world breaks against us, what do we do? In his book, Hand Me Another Brick, Charles Swindoll relates a story about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, as we know, invented a ton of different things, the microphone, the phonograph, the incandescent lights, the storage battery, talking movies, and more than a thousand other patents carry his name. Uh, whether or not there's some debate <laughs> whether or not he invented them all or, or stole some of them or whatever, but he's responsible for a ton of invention in our country. On December th- in December of 1914, he had worked for 10 years on developing a storage battery which would supply electricity to a large demand for cities. It had greatly strained his finances. He was almost broke. Then one particular evening, spontaneous combustion broke out in his film room, and his factory was burned to the ground. Everything that he had worked for for years was in the factory. And, and the buildings were only insured, even though it wound up being about a $2 million loss, the building was only insured for about $238,000 because they were of concrete and they were supposed to be indestructible to fire. And he lost everything. That night, his son, Charles, frantically began looking for 67, by Tom, Thomas Edison was 67 at the time, began frantically looking for his father. He found him, and he's standing, watching his factory just in complete flames in the middle of the night. His white hair was sticking up, and he had smudged soot on his face. And his father finds him and says, Dad, I, I was worried about you. Are you okay? And his, and his dad says, where's your mother? She's fine. Yeah, she's fine. She's back in the house. He says, well, go get her. Have her look at this. Isn't this the most beautiful sight you've ever seen? You rarely see a fire of this magnitude in the middle of the night. His son thought his dad had gone over the deep end. Then his dad said this, there's great value in disaster. All our mistakes are burned up. Thank God we can start brand new tomorrow. Thank God we can start brand new tomorrow. Today as we look at this last section of the Sermon on the Mount, I want to remind you that if you've gone through this, the last, the section before this was a warning for us to be careful of listening to people, of teachers who bring the gospel message. And that warning was intended uh, for the listener. The question which each of you needs to reflect on today is this. When the world breaks against your carefully manicured life, when it looks like everything that was important to you is just swirling away, are you so certain that God is your anchor? Are you blaming God? Or are you looking for his certain and loving hand in the midst of your tragedy? 
One of the things about this passage I noticed as I studied through it is that all of the things that happen to those houses that are built, are built irrespectively on the rock and on the sand, they're, they're expressed in the, in the past tense, in the aorist tense. In other words, these things have happened. And, and Jesus makes it clear throughout his ministry that bad things happen. And bad things even happen to good people. Tragedy is a part of our lives. Pain, death, heartbreak, they're equal rights arbiters. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or man or woman or rich or poor or highly educated or uneducated. Pain is the single certainty that we can expect in our lives. And one of the things that I've noticed is, is that that pain is so universal that we automatically find connection with people who are going through pain, don't we? Uh, I, I've got the lovely experience of having two granddaughters at my house, and so we watch a lot of kids' movies, and we watched Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory this weekend. And, uh, one, of, one of my great all-time favorite movies. But the girls and I, we started, and, and, and their nan and my wife, we started talking about about movies, we start talking about how many movies with animals in them are, are sad, like Old Yeller and all. The, and, and and my oldest granddaughter said to me, she goes, "Well, if it's got an animal in it, you can bet somebody's going to die." That's what she said to me. And and I think of those movies that we've sat there and we've cried through, right? The tears, and I'm sitting over there and my trying not to cry, and through some of those movies that that we've watched, but we find a connection with people they experience pain. For those of us who've read God's word, we find the clear conviction that believers are not absent from that pain. We all remember Job, an incredible, great, righteous man who lost everything. And then when his friends show up to comfort him, they try to convict him that the reason he'd lost it was because of his unrighteousness. We remember Naomi, who in a foreign country lost her husband and both sons. How many of us have read the story of Martha and Mary? John chapter 11, and along with Jesus, wept at the pain that they were experiencing at the loss of their brother. One of my favorite authors of all time is C.S. Lewis. His life on many levels, was a tragic one. He grew up in a home with a father who was very disconnected from him. And he was so distant and kind of eccentric that when, when Lewis, uh, when C.S. Lewis was wounded during World War I, he wound up coming back to England and spending a long time in a convalescent uh, home as he was getting better. His father lived less than 60 miles away from him and never once came to see him. And Lewis had determined that he, would, he was honor-bound to taking care of his mom, so he brought her into his home, and she went through a long period of time where she needed extra care, and, and he took care of her. Finally, in his 50s, he met a woman, and it looked like for the first time in his life, Lewis was going to find that happiness that had eluded him, that personal happiness. And her name was Joyce. Joy Grisham. And, uh, and she, she was, they were so attracted, they were, they were equals in intellect. And, and I think that's partly why he was so attracted to her. And, and they, they began a romance. And, uh, and she, like him, had been an atheist and had didn't come to faith and had uh, had a well thought out and secure faith of her own that she had experienced. And, and shortly after after they began um, having a, a romantic relationship, she was experiencing some pain in her hip, and she found out that she had bone cancer. If Lewis wound up marrying her, and it was a hospital bed for years. C.S. Lewis experienced what he called the most intense pain of his life. He did what Lewis always did. 
filled three journals with what he was experiencing. Later on, those journals were gathered up and they were edited and published in a book called A Grief Observed. One of the things that Staples talks about, that uh, C.S. Lewis talks about, he says that this pain has hurt me in so many ways that I discover those hurts only one by one. So by the time he gets to the end of the book, he realizes that the constant that has helped him through the pain was the presence And he said, this emotional well-being that he experienced wasn't like a sudden opening of a door or throwing open of something. He said instead, it was like the warming of a room at the coming of daylight. Because when you first notice the daylight, it's already been there for a while. Then you notice. Being in relationship with God does not mean that tragedy and pain will not find you. But being in relationship, a serious relationship with God, having your foundation set on that rock will lead you to a place where as you experience that pain and as you experience that heartbreak, when you get to the end of it, you realize you're still able to stand because you're standing on a rock. And your life is set. The rock will allow you to stand up to the calamity that you encounter. In this passage, Jesus affirms that a good house building requires the structure to be founded on the rock. The verb, which is translated in the passage I read, is a fairly rare form. It's for those of you Greek nerds, it's a pluperfect, which we find very few of those in the New Testament. It's a past completed action with continuing results at the time. A past completed action with continuing results. It goes something like this. The foundation was being laid in the past, and after that, the foundation was completed, and the continuing results was that it stood. ESV represents this with the language, it has been founded upon the rock. I think this means that in our Christian walk, there are some preliminary foundations which we have to get under our belt at the beginning. Somewhere in our Christian development early on, we have to get to some fundamental things that take place in our lives in order for the foundation to get the first few blocks laid on that rock. This idea that there are preliminary foundations that are being built on is really throughout the New Testament. Let me share a couple of verses with you. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the households of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. You see, there are elementary principles that we must incorporate into our lives. And these things, these articles of faith, let me call them, these articles of faith, they have to be more real than the pain that we're experiencing. They have to be more real than the absence of money or wealth. They have to be more real to us. The early church recognized this as it grew up out of this idea of, of pain and martyrdom and all the things that was happening to it. And it developed a set of creeds that all believers attested to, that they believed these things. These are the foundations upon which they build their faith. 
Let me share an early creed with you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe that he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. I believe that he descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. I believe that he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the church, the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. are foundational beliefs that we have to incorporate into our lives. And we build them as we understand through the word of God that these are what God intends for us to live on. It is foundational beliefs which we lay on the rock of Christ to build our life around. Interestingly enough, there's something in this passage which I don't think is reflected clearly in English translation. The person on whose house was the rock literally has the rain, flood, and wind fall on the house. While the person on the sand is represented having those same things beat against their house. Ongoing. See, the same tragedy, the same thing that you're experiencing wherever you're at, Whatever you go through, whatever life brings you, the same thing that you go through, if your life is set upon these principles, the promise from Scripture is that we will be able to stand up to it. It's not saying we won't feel pain. We will. It's not saying that we won't experience hardship. We will. It's a promise of Scripture. So what it is saying is that as we stand on that rock, as we stand on those foundational beliefs, as we do that, our lives will be solid enough to take the pain. Tragedy is deeper and harder to recover from if our foundation is built on our own success or our own ability or anything other than the solid rock of Christ Jesus and Lord. I think the last thing that we need to learn from this passage is, is not only that tragedies come, and they will, and some of you are experiencing those now, and not only that that foundation has to be built, but I think the final thing is what Jesus is representing here at the end of his sermon is that the building needs to go on. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop. There's not a time when we get to a time in our lives and we say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got a pretty good life. I'll just... My, my spiritual life is just where it needs to be. I'll be happy if it stays this way the rest of my life. I, I used to believe that. I used to believe that there was a time when I would get to a place in my spiritual life, I could just kind of rock back with God and say, yeah, I'm pretty good, God. You doing okay? It doesn't work that way. Our lives have to continue, continue, and continue to have spiritual input so that that foundation is bolstered up. Jesus says in this closing that hearing's not enough. You've got to do something. Hearing is not enough. You've got to do something. Both the builder on the rock and the builder on the sand heard. But it was he who had the rock foundation that survived the storm. One of the things I think we need to be clear on is exactly what Jesus is calling us to do. Not only to hear, but to do. He says that everyone hears, but not everyone does his word. So let's review the, the sermon. Let's review the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount and what he asks us to do. The first thing that he asks us to do is to have a new vision of what a blessed life looks like. We call those the B attitudes, right? Blessed. Makarios is the word. I really think it should be happy. Happy is the man. Happy is the man who does this. Happy is the man who reconfigures his life so that his end goal is spiritual and not physical. Secondly, 
We're called to have an effect on the world. We're supposed to be flavor to the flavorless, right? We're supposed to be light to the dark, salt and light, a city set on a hill. We're supposed to have an effect in the world around us. One of the great preachers from elder days said that we were supposed to be the world's disinfectant. Kind of apropos in the midst of our current culture. Jesus calls us to have a deeper sensitivity to righteousness. And things like, don't allow just the law to tell you what's good, but let your spirit move you even further. And if you slap somebody, somebody. Go further. Go deeper. We're called to demonstrate a hidden righteousness. A righteousness which is so focused on Christ that our actions can be invisible to others. And that's okay. Because we know that what we're doing is intended for God's benefit. An audience of one. Jesus in the sermon calls us to have a deep communication with God. Prayer that is constant. We're called to have a kingdom priority in regards to our actions and living out our lives. We're supposed to participate in things like fasting and almsgiving. We're called to have a kingdom priority in our relationships, to give priority to others and seeing ourselves as representatives of Christ in all of our doing. And we're called to seek out good teachers. We're called to be able to recognize false teachers. This is the building. The place. These are the things that we're called to do. I want to leave you with, with one other short story. Ronald Meredith in his book, Hurrying Big for Little Reason, describes one quiet night in early spring. I experienced this lately, and it, it made me, it, it called this passage to mind uh, that I'd read a long time ago. He said, he said it was early spring, and suddenly out of the night came the sound of wild geese flying. Have you all noticed all the geese that we've had around lately? Uh, yesterday, I got the joy of being out on the golf course, and Jason Posnick and I saw a family of geese with mom or dad in front and mom or dad behind, and a whole line of little ones as they were going uh, around the golf course. It was, it was fantastic. But he says, I ran to the house and breath breathlessly announced the excitement to everyone inside of what I felt. What is to compare with wild geese flying across the moon on a spring night? I, it might have ended there, except for the sight of our tame mallards and geese in the pond. They heard the wild call they had once known. The honking out of the night sent little arrows of prompting deep into their wild yesterdays. Their wings fluttered a feeble response. The urge to fly, to take their place in the sky for which God made them, was sounding in their little feathered breasts. But they never got out of the water. The matter had been settled long ago. The corn of the barnyard was too tempting. Now their desire to fly only made them feel. Fluttered their wings. Temptation is always enjoyed at the price of losing the capacity for flight. Some of you, I hope, that are listening to this broadcast, this, this may be the last chapel you ever experience here at Central, and you're getting ready to fly. And part of what I want to do today is remind you that you were built to fly. You weren't built for a fall. You were built to fly in the Experience what he has intended for you. And the way that you do that is participate in all the adventure that he's got set in front of you. Build your life on the foundation of love. Stand up in tragedy. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for the grace and the mercy that we've been able to experience. Thank you, Father, that that's the reality of every day that we wake up. As we share our lives with one another, share the grace and the mercy that you distribute into our lives with one another. Thank you, Father, for a reminder from your word. Build. To build our lives on basic truth. 
and then continue to build our lives through basic Christian practices over and over. Help us, Father, to be your representatives in the dark world. Your flavor. Love you, Father, and I pray you're blessed in Christ's name.